Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Neuroprosthesis Seminar um, for March. Um, we're, we're very honored and, and happy to have Dr. Benjamin Greenberg as our speaker today. And Dr. Greenberg is a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University. And maybe uh, closest to us, our heart, he's the associate director of the Center for Neurorestoration and Neurotechnology at the Providence VA. So that's a center um, that's in the same program as the APT Center and the FES Center, one of our uh, friends in the, in the VA. So Dr. Greenberg has a, a bachelor's degree in psychology, a PhD in neurosciences from uh, University of California, San Diego, an MD from the University of Miami, and then had training in neurology at Columbia University, and finally, and maybe most importantly for, for Dr. Greenberg, in psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. So he was at the, um, at the, at the NIH, uh, National Institute of Mental Health, uh, for a number of years, right, and uh, became the chief of the Adult Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Research uh, in the Laboratory of Clinical Sciences. Uh, he moved to Providence in 2000, and he is at Butler Hospital and Brown Medical School, and um, I'll let him talk about his work. So, the, uh, again, Dr. Greenberg joined the, the Center for um, Neurorestoration and Neurotechnology at Providence VA about four years ago, and um, he's their associate director. So, please, Ben. Thanks. All right, thanks, Bob, for that very nice introduction. Yeah, I was at the uh, VA Center um, for two years as a volunteer, um, and, and then they started paying me a little bit uh, two years ago, and then uh, more. So um, I, I consider that progress. The, uh, what I'm going to be uh, talking about is stuff that's really occurred mostly in the middle institution here, that's, that's Butler Hospital. Uh, that has involved, um, uh, at least for the deep brain stimulation part, the Cleveland Clinic from the beginning. The VA is over here, the Brown Institute for Brain Science, which is a, in, in a house, uh, big house, but it's a house, uh, it is over here. And so we have a lot of collaborative links, including increasingly with the School of Engineering that used to be just a department at Brown, but now it's a full-fledged school. I want to mention the disclosures. So I'm going to be talking about transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a, an FDA-approved uh, treatment for depression, both in the US and elsewhere in the world. Uh, deep brain stimulation at this VCVS target, which stands for ventral capsule ventral striatum, uh, is uh, approved for humanitarian use uh, by FDA, and that was on the basis of some earlier work that I'm not going to show, a uh, uh, collaborative work of ours and that included uh, Cleveland, for example. Um, it has full approval in the EU for OCD, um, and any form of magnetic or electrical stimulation um, is off-label for all other um, really neuropsychiatric illnesses. The regulatory status is evolving, as some of you may know, for the transcranial electrical uh, stimulation. I just got an, something mailed to me this morning about a home TDCS device made by a South Korean company called Ybrain, which I think at this point they can actually sell without, regu without any, any approval, although that may change. In terms of my uh, links to industry, I don't get any industry uh, funding uh, for research or as a consultant. I don't have any patents. Um, they don't fund my travel. This, uh, this study, uh, um, the, the DBS for OCD study, which I will start with, uh, was funded entirely by NIMH, although a precursor was funded by um, the NARSAD Foundation. Um, uh, we did have technical support from Medtronic, but that's as far as it went, and clinical support if patients needed something. Collaborators are many, um, and uh, I, I won't go through the whole list, but they are multidisciplinary. So we really have um, uh, 
neurologists, neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, of course, neuropsychologists, um, and uh, engineers, uh, in, and neuroscientists, including neuroanatomists, involved uh, at all phases of really both the invasive and non-invasive stimulation work that we have been doing. Um, the, uh, uh, the DBS controlled trial um, was headquartered at our place at Butler Hospital in Brown. The Cleveland Clinic and the University of Florida actually were the first three and only three implanting sites as the study was designed, but we had such difficulty recruiting appropriate patients that we later expanded to eight centers, including uh, Mass General, Mayo Clinic, uh, Mount Sinai, GW, Kaiser in North Carolina, uh, North, uh, Northern California, and the University of uh, Chicago. The general idea um, that we need to be thinking about the anatomical wiring and the molecular microcircuit nature of the brain uh, when we design psychiatric treatments is relatively new. It's not new in neurology, which focuses more on wiring or neurosurgery. You know, psychiatry has had uh, a kind of chemical soup approach. We give pills that affect neurotransmitters. Uh, the brain is clearly not a bag of, let's say, serotonin, uh, but, uh, but until relatively recently, the, um, uh, there hasn't been a merging of the uh, neurotransmission uh, perspective with that of neurocircuitry. And that is happening now. This uh, paper on being a circuit psychiatrist comes from Josh Gordon, who is apparently not the guy who is with the Cleveland Browns, um, uh, who gets into trouble for other kinds of substance use. Um, that, so that's not him. Uh, it's, uh, but he is a basic scientist. So in this paper, he's talking. It's, it's very forward-looking, talking about things like optogenetics or molecular targeting of circuits, which is not what I'm going to be talking about today, um, because that stuff is really far in the future. The, uh, um, but he does have a nod to TMS and DBS um, and how we need to understand the mechanisms better to improve efficacy and further acceptance of these things. So I'm going to talk about um, approaches, uh, three different approaches to OCD. Really, I'm going to mention four of them. OCD is a bad thing. Uh, it, it, its prevalence in the population is uh, about 2% um, over a lifetime, and in the U.S., the best data are probably 1.2% at one year. Um, because it starts early in life and it can be very consuming, it's, according to the WHO, it's the sixth most incapacitating neuropsychiatric illness. And that category is actually very high on the list of causes of disability, uh, especially in industrialized countries, but not only, um, you know, as the burdens of infectious disease and other uh, illnesses that go with low development have been uh, dealt with to a large extent. The, um, Conventional treatments, which are um, medications and behavior therapy that is usually based on exposure and the principles of behavioral extinction from learning theory, are, uh, work really well in, let's say, about 60% of patients. So anything I'm going to be talking about now is going to be what you would try to apply to the patients who don't get adequate uh, responses to those things. But they, the, any of these circuit-based, device-based approaches are in addition to uh, the conventional treatments, not substituting for them as we use them now. Now, here's, a, here's an example of somebody illustrating OCD. I still find myself torturing myself because in now I do the same thing when I take my tranquilizers, the diazepams. I want to make sure I took the diazepams, they're yellow. I stare at the diazepams in my hand for approximately a minute. And even though my eyesight can see that they're yellow, why then do I just say they're yellow? But I don't do that. I hold it in my hand for a minute, 
starting to perspire once again because my eyesight is looking at the yellow pill, but my mind is going, you gotta concentrate on the color. You gotta concentrate on the color. You gotta concentrate on the color so deep that my mind still feels I've got to make sure this is yellow when I'm staring at it. And even though my mind sees a 90% yellow, there's something inside me that's going, I'm not 100% positive. This has to be examined. This, got to be, this has to be tested, analyzed. Now, when I put my padlock on my door <coughs> for my stereo system, it is exactly what I do every night. I put the padlock on the door, lock it. Then when I get done, I open it and lock it again. Then when I get done, I open it and lock it again. And then when I get done, I open it and lock it again. And this goes on 10 times, sometimes 20. And while I'm doing it, once again, I'll worry about any given thing. What if the pole of the chain didn't go all the way through the hole? What if I was not accurate and it's not exactly in the hole? What if I didn't press hard enough? Well, I can't remember how I press. Let me, let me, let me analyze this. And after 30 times of checking that lock, I go to sleep, finding myself still feeling tortured that even you never know. What if? What if that door's not really locked? Okay, so this illustrates a central feature of OCD, which is doubt. Um, and he is unable to satisfy himself that he has completed this action satisfactorily or that he knows what pills he is taking. Now, um, this, uh, he's not uh, actually worried about some disaster happening. He's not worried that if he doesn't wash his hands, uh, some OCD patients have this problem. In fact, it's more common if you wash your hands that they'll get contaminated. They will either make themselves sick due to chemical or biological contaminant, or make someone else sick. That's called harm avoidance. This is what we call incompleteness, the inability to satisfy yourself that an action has been satisfactorily completed, to get the sense that it's done just right. And this is what you see in uh, OCD patients who tend to have overlap with Tourette's syndrome, uh, so it's viewed as a kind of toretic OCD. It's harder to treat than the harm avoidant kind, and so we see a higher percentage of these patients um, with incompleteness in uh, the patients who might come to brain surgery, for example. Most patients will have some uh, contribution of both uh, of these kinds of things. So doubt, really, in French, uh, um, uh, doubt, OCD was the doubting disorder, um, and uh, the uh, and and some of the descri earliest descriptions of this were were in uh, French. Actually, some of the earliest descriptions of OCD go back to Babylon, uh, and uh, where they thought that the uh, these behaviors, which are clearly compulsions, um, were a mystery because they didn't seem like they were a punishment from the gods. Lots of other things seemed to be a punishment from the gods, but they, they thought this was mysterious uh, 4,000 years ago. And then in the Roman Empire, there were descriptions usually of scrupulosity, which is another kind of OCD. I'll get to that. But, the, um, but uh, Pierre Janet in 1903, who really coined the term incompleteness, thought this exaggerated need for perfection was to compensate for doubt. Um, but there, that's not all there is to OCD. So here's the classic contamination and cleaning. This person is go engaging in rituals. I have a patient right now who goes through eight gallons of bleach a day to clean her house. She just uh, wipes them out of the stores. Um, and uh, uh, she knows it's not reasonable mostly, but can't stop. This is a doubt a patient who is driving and feels a bump. Well, what if I just ran over someone? And people can have this to such an extent that they can't travel. Uh, there are even uh, patients who can't walk because they're afraid they'll run into people and, 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 and harm them. This person is showering to get a sense that the showering is done just right. Um, so the water, the hot water has been gone for hours. Some patients like this will in fact um, uh, not shower, not bathe for months, many months, because it's too arduous. 
to try to get that feeling. A related phenomenon is this one, symmetry, ordering, and arranging. So this person is trying to put everything in exactly the right place. This is, and that, that's usually a proxy for incompleteness or goes with it. This is uh, taboo thoughts, the religious, sexual, and aggressive thoughts, people who are afraid they will attack children, either sexually or violently, or people uh, who uh, believe that they will have offended God. So some of the earliest uh, descriptions of, um, of OCD come from religious literature. And if you talk to pretty much any Catholic priest about scrupulosity, they kind of light up because they really know what that is, and, uh, and they see it among their parishioners. And then, of course, there's hoarding, which um, has been uh, semi-separated from, uh, from OCD. You can have compulsive um, uh, motivations for hoarding, that you have to know exactly what you have, and you can't discard anything until you know something or go through a, a sense of uh, uh, you know, kind of ritualized uh, series of behavioral steps. But they are also, there's also hoarders who have no other kinds of OCD symptoms, and they just uh, accumulate stuff um, uh, to the point where they become a public health hazards uh, because they feel they have to, and it makes them more comfortable. Okay, so that's a, a whirlwind tour clinically through OCD. Now, there is neurocircuitry neuro that has been uh, repeated, repeatedly implicated in OCD, uh, starting really in the 1980s, really before that, uh, with some of the early surgeries, um, the idea that frontal subcortical connections were important, um, but, uh, and, and actually the effects of lobotomy, which often were positive for OCD, even if the side effects were uh, tragic in many cases. The, uh, but some of the elements of the circuitry, and I'm going to be returning to this, uh, that are implicated are the dorsal anterior cingulate here, the orbital frontal cortex here, the basal ganglia, this is the caudate nucleus, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, the caudate and the, uh, the uh, putamen and globus pallidum. There are fiber tracts that connect all of these things and then also go down, go to the thalamus, midline nuclei, and, um, and down to the brainstem. The surgeries that I'm going to be talking about really inter uh, intervene in this pathway here where there's a lot of compactness to these projections. And this is an example for, of deep brain stimulation for OCD in a network context. So if you go to this rectangle and blow it up, what you're showing, and this is work from Suzanne Haber, who is a neuroanatomist I work with closely. She's at Rochester and now McLean hospital uh, outside of Boston, um, you can see that connections from the thalamus to various parts of ventral prefrontal cortex um, are represented here. Um, and they follow predictable rules in terms of what's represented where. So the medial uh, areas of cortex are represented more ventrally down at the bottom of the capsule, and the lateral ones are represented more dorsally. Um, but there is a tremendous amount of individual variability uh, in uh, where these pathways run in people. This track tracing, by the way, was done in macaques, and then there's an attempt to, to uh, translate it using uh, diffusion imaging, both in the macaques, but also in humans, including patients. So uh, um, now let's get on to the, the surgeries. Um, really since during the heyday, in fact, before the heyday of lobotomy, um, in the 1940s, Taylorac, who was a neurosurgeon and he created a well-known brain imaging atlas, um, in, in the 1940s was among a group of surgeons saying, lobotomy is too crude. We need to try to reduce the size of the lesions we're making, make them more selective to try to avoid some side effects. And so he invented the technique of um, anterior capsulotomy. The idea of lesioning, usually with a, a probe, 
a, th a thermal probe, the anterior limb of the internal capsule connecting the thalamus to cortex, prefrontal cortex. Um, and these were pretty large lesions initially. The procedure was fully developed and, and used most by Lars Lexell, who also, uh, who is a neurosurgeon in Sweden, who also invented something called the gamma knife. I'm not going to show you a picture of the gamma knife, but here are the lesions you can make. So this is a destructive procedure that is non-invasive because you focus more than 200 beams of radiation on uh, areas of the brain uh, and with some variability, um, months, to, uh, months later, you will get lesions in this territory. And this technique was really refined by a psychiatrist colleague at Brown, Steve Rasmussen, working with neurosurgeons, and uh, been used continuously at our site with refinements since 1993. The paper uh, describing all of that case material is finally uh, uh, under review. So we're, we'll, that will be available uh, sometime, hopefully, uh, this year. That target, in turn, uh, led to uh, ventral capsule ventral striatum deep brain stimulation, which was first uh, used by Bart Nutan and colleagues in Belgium. Um, now, one thing I want to point out is in all of these studies, which I've described up to now, they've been open label. The response rate has been 40 to 70 percent, or more, more narrowly, 50 to 60 percent, from the 1940s. Um, irrespective of the diagnostic system, the conventional treatments that, when, that were used to and had to fail to declare somebody refractory, uh, and the imaging uh, of availability. So it's remarkable that these things have changed. Now, I believe that many of the patients that would uh, have been operated on in bygone days would not get surgery now. So I think the group uh, operated on is now truly more uh, refractory, in fact, intractable, which is our criterion. Um, but it's still remarkable that these things are about the same. Now, the uh, NIMH DBS for OCD trial was a long trial. It's still going on. Uh, I'm going to show you one year data. The, uh, this is only the second time these data have been presented publicly. The first time was on Monday at the second international brain stimulation meeting in Barcelona, uh, which I actually recommend to you. This meeting is, uh, that meeting is every two years. Uh, the next one is going to be in North America, they say, the organizers. It's the only meeting that um, I've been to that includes neurologists, psychiatrists, and rehab people all of whom using various kinds of brain stimulation, both invasive and mostly non-invasive. Uh, so it's actually a perfect meeting for the kinds of rehabilitation um, across uh, disorders that we're thinking about. Um, and uh, I haven't seen a meeting really like that. So, so watch for that in a couple of years. So here are the Cleveland Clinic folks, um, Andre Machado, the surgeon, Don Malone, the psychiatrist. Um, neither of them was able to come today. They asked for the slides, so of course I sent them because, you know, they helped give us some data. But, um, uh, and they, they say hi to people they know in the room here. Uh, the, uh, but um, the support was originally, it was kind of seeded by uh, NARSAT, a foundation, NIMH. This took, for those of you who are into NIH grants, an, a fairly unprecedented third no-cost extension to try to finish this uh, study because of the trouble we had recruiting. We initially proposed a, a sample of 24 to NIH. They said, no, do more and do it for less money, which is what they always say. And so we said 30, uh, and, then they, and then they cut our budget. And then we, uh, we wound up with 27. Now, why is it, was it so hard to recruit? Well, it's um, really a very small subset of treatment-seeking patients that we're talking about. So um, we've got, um, uh, this is from data from a longitudinal study 
325 of them, naturalistic relief followed. And if you just serially apply our entry criteria, which is a Yale-Brown OC scale, that's the severity scale we use, of 28 or more, um, that's, very, that's extremely severe. Um, they've had to have had more than three uh, trials of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, one of which has to be clomipramine, which is a second or third line drug. And they had to have had an, what we considered an adequate trial of behavior therapy, which is ERP, exposure and response prevention. Uh, and it, the number of people out of that sample who'd had those things at entry was small. And if you applied the other entry criteria, really the fitness for surgery and some other things, um, uh, you know, we got uh, about 0.6 percent of this population. Now, deep brain uh, stimulation, these are pe pictures from MGH, one of our sites, and Ahmad Eskandar was the surgeon there. We target this region in the uh, ventral part of the internal, uh, anterior limb of the internal capsule and the ventral striatum. What Suzanne Haber showed is actually there are fibers here that uh, are parallel to the rest of the internal capsule, even though this area looks like gray matter. So she has helped expand the construct of the anterior limb here. This is the original lead that uh, goes in. This is the so-called 3391 model lead, which has um, three uh, millimeter, it's not, not actually to scale, I'm noticing now. It has three millimeter uh, cylindrical contacts separated by three millimeters. This came from a spinal lead. We felt that we'd refine the targeting based on uh, pilot work and that we could use this one instead. This is the 3387 Medtronic lead that is typically used for, par uh, for uh, uh, Parkinson's and subthalamic stimuli. And each of these contacts is 1.5 millimeters separated by 1.5 millimeters. I wanted one that had about six contacts uh, with this spacing and size, and they, they didn't have it. So we wound up using this. And I will jump to the end. I mentioned the, in, the variability across uh, individuals here. Well, uh, the, we wound up using in different people with roughly the same uh, implantation trajectory and site, each of these electrodes as really the active cathode uh, and sometimes combinations of them. Uh, and so we were in the correct territory, but it looks like it's variable across individuals. When you program these things, um, there are a variety of ways of doing it. In fact, the parameter space is vast, uh, and that's a huge problem and a burden for programming. But uh, you can have monopolar stimulation uh, or uh, bipolar stimulation, so monopolar against the case of the device, which is essentially elect at an electrically infinite distance. Um, and also multipolar stimulation across a lead with different combinations. The programmer is here. Um, the original one was in a suitcase, a 1970s technology. This is like a Palm Pilot. Um, and I've broken three of these because they're really very flimsy, this, this cord. Um, I've learned how not to do that. Um, you wind up programming the amplitude, the pulse width, uh, and the frequency. And here, you can see that you can independently program different contacts to do different things. So you can see that it's quite uh, a vast array of options you have. And by no means have we explored all of them. But we have converged on some parameters, which I'm happy to talk about in the question period. The way we did this study, for the mast phase, we used non-rechargeable devices. Because obviously, if somebody's recharging their device, they're going to know whether they're getting stimulated or not. Um, and then for the open phase, because we were really using higher energies than these devices, which were designed mostly for movement disorders, were intended to deliver, we used an, a rechargeable device, the Activa RC. Um, which didn't create too many problems. Look at this happy person being uh, doing her recharging. Uh, now, this is, yeah. Um, this uh, actual thing that holds it in place uh, basically uh, sucks, and uh, the patients hate it, um, and so they come up with other, other uh, um, uh, solutions to this problem. The patients get their own programmer, um, and they can check whether the device is on, whether the battery is adequately charged. Um, uh, you can also allow them limited uh, ability to change their parameters, but we have not done that. The overall study design, 
uh, patients were randomized to sham or active. We did something called earn randomization to try to mac, uh, match them on various characteristics, including baseline severity, uh, which worked well, but the other matching uh, was, uh, in, for some measures, not, not perfect, as I'll show you. We wound up randomizing 12 uh, to sham and 15 to active. We had three co-primary endpoints, the Il brown OC scale, the Y box, the global uh, um, uh, assessment of functioning, or the GAF, and the SOFAS, uh, which is only the social and occupational functioning elements of the GAF. The GAF is really a global measure that includes symptom severity and function. For those of you who work in the VA RR&D world, um, it's the functional measures that might be most salient to them. Right? Does functioning improve not only symptoms? I won't belabor this slide in the interest of time, but here's the N of 27. They were 40 on average. The youngest was 21. The oldest was 64. On average, their age at symptom onset was 12, and the duration of illness was almost 30 years. Uh, so these people had been chronically ill, not necessarily chronically ill at the level of severity we required at entry, but they'd been ill for a long time. Uh, we had a slight male preponderance. Uh, sometimes uh, men can be more difficult to treat um, with conventional treatments. Uh, most of them were, were white. Um, and the uh, Yale Brown OC scale severity was 33 and a half, which means that most of their waking time, and sometimes all of their waking time, was being consumed by these obsessive thoughts and compulsive urges. And some of these patients were housebound. The GAF um, uh, thir uh, uh, of 39 was, represents severe impairment. So to get into a hospital, an inpatient psychiatric hospital, and insurance companies don't like to pay for that, so a GAF score of, of 35 to 40 might get you in. They might say that qualifies you. Um, to get into a psychiatric day program that insurance companies don't like to pay for either, uh, the threshold is often around 45. So they were quite sick, and the SOFAS is very similar. Uh, I won't go over the other metrics. So to get to the outcomes, here is the sham phase, here are the active phase. 33.5 uh, um, score at baseline, and we match those very well. And what we, uh, what we get to here um, is at the end of 12 weeks, we picked a three-month sham period, which turned out probably not to have been optimally long enough, um, but because we got more of a sham drop, which I'll talk about, than we expected. Uh, but um, at the end of one year, uh, it was still greater, the drop was greater in active. At the end of one year, they went down from the mid-30s to about 20. And that is the score in an average OCD outpatient. So that's moderately ill. Um, and that is what we would have expected from the open label data. So here are the stats using a, a generalized linear model. Um, we find a, a very large effect size at 12 weeks, extremely large. That's 1.8. That's big statistically. But because we had a, a, a sham drop, which has started to fade away by three months, we think it would have faded away further if we'd uh, kept them sham longer, but we didn't think we needed to and we ethically didn't want to. Uh, uh, so the, the p-value is 0.09. When you switch the sham to active, you have a highly significant further drop in their symptoms. Um, of course, this is open label at that point. All right. Now the GAF, the Global Assessment of Functioning, is highly significant, uh, highly significant improvement compared to sham at 12 weeks. Again, when you shift, uh, but, but, um, and when you sh shift to sham, uh, the sham to active, the same thing happens as happened with the OCD severity. This effect size is very large at 2.2. The social and occupational assessment is, is comparable. Um, this is just functioning and not symptoms, and this is significant. Um, it's not as uh, significant when you uh, switch. Uh, it takes a little bit longer, as if having sham first might have delayed some of these uh, functional gains. 
if you look at the OCD severity response categories, what you see here, if you just look at the top line, um, that um, nobody in sham at the end of the mast phase became a full responder, uh, although a, a large number of the sample at active did, and this actually is a significant difference. Um, we did ask them if, uh, if we thought they were on or not. The two sham patients who thought they were on showed this trajectory in the Y box. They had a rapid, a marked reduction in their symptoms, which then began to uh, creep back towards their baseline. And then when we turned the DBS on here, they showed a rapid and, and relatively sustained drop. Um, we, uh, so I think their judgment that they were on was because their symptoms were improving. Um, we also showed significant improvements in depression and nonspecific anxiety. Um, uh, well, sorry, the nonspecific anxiety at 12 weeks was not, was, was at trend level. But um, these were moderately large effect sizes. Of course, you want to know what the adverse effects are. Um, and adverse effects in device trials can be due to uh, the device, the procedure, uh, ongoing therapy, or patient-specific uh, issues. And uh, we had um, four unique events in the first 12 months um, who, uh, uh, where patients had worsening of symptoms, uh, became, their moods became labile and slightly hypomanic, and we had two infections. One, because one of the patients engaged in skin picking. Um, which is, uh, you know, one of the concerns we had for this population. But this is certainly, uh, this compares favorably with what you'd see in DBS for movement disorders. In terms of non-serious adverse effects, uh, things that don't require hospitalization or um, uh, in more intensive care, got a lot of headache in five patients. Um, some of them were pre-existing, but when you have brain surgery, you can get a headache. Uh, the, uh, and some OCD symptoms got worse, uh, or anxiety, or depression, uh, and the pretty much expected post-surgical um, uh, pain and discomfort, which usually is in the first three days after the procedure. Um, five patients reported no uh, adverse events at all. So. Okay, I'm going to stop here and move on to non-invasive stimulation for OCD. Um, and uh, maybe I'll take questions at the end. So why do it? Well, as I think I've shown you, there's a vastly larger pool of patients who would be appropriate for non-invasive approaches. And the cost and logistics of care are favorable. Um, DBS is very expensive, not only in terms of how much the devices cost and how much the surgeries cost, um, but the uh, intensity of uh, follow-up that is required is, is expensive. Um, uh, why, why not do it? Well, you know when you're making a hole in uh, the brain or when you're putting an electrode in, you're likely to have effects on the core circuitry. Um, and so clearly, um, the expectation would be that for non-invasive stimulation, you would need lots of work, as was required for depression. So depression got approved for, um, uh, uh, you know, TMS for depression, uh, for example, got approved after probably 15 years of work on it. Um, it took a long time and many, many, many studies and, and regimens that include lots of treatments to shift the mechanisms. Um, I just want to, uh, I, I'm not going to focus on the details here, but this is non-invasive brain stimulation in a network context. And if we think about areas that might um, be considered core of the OCD circuitry based on functional imaging and other things, we've got the dorsal cingulate, orbital frontal cortex, and the dorsal striatum as part of that circuitry. The cognitive control circuitry, uh, so-called dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, pre-supplementary motor area and ventrolateral PFC may be cortical windows that would allow this circuitry to be modulated. And in red, we're showing ventromedial prefrontal cortex and amygdala as um, motion processing areas. 
So in this work, we started out with, uh, we have three phases where we're doing brain scans, brain stimulation course, another brain scan, plus some cognitive measures. Um, we're starting out with transcranial DC stimulation, where we're trying uh, to using things like uh, Marome Bixon's model, although we're not using high definition uh, stimulation, we're using the standard pads to affect the pre SMA and the dorsal anterior cingulate. Um, that's phase one. We started with that because that's the easiest to do. Um, why should we uh, be optimistic that this might work? Um, an early TDCS clinical study that I'll, I'll show you now suggests some promise. And there's some mechanistic support that we could affect the brain circuitry of interest. So here is a study by Giordano Durso from Naples where they did a polarity, a study of polarity dependence trying to stimulate the pre-SMA either with cathodal or anodal TDCS. Their return electrode was extracephalic on the deltoid um, in this study and what they uh, showed um, and they had, you know, uh, small numbers, this is a very preliminary study, that um, cathodal stimulation, this, this means a positive change, in other words, they got less severe, and this means they got more severe, um, uh, showed a hint of improvement, and that uh, when they got anodal stimulation, sometimes they got worse. And in fact, they offered the patients a chance to switch to the other polarity, and uh, everybody with anodal except maybe one of their patients switched to cathodal after which they showed some improvement. Now um, the idea uh, that you might be able to modulate the circuitry with TDCS is supported by a number of uh, more basic studies but here's one that is of particular interest to us. This was done by Reinhardt and Woodman published in 2014 in the Journal of Neuroscience. And what they did here was um, key in on the phenomenon of error-related negativity, which is a, an EEG-evoked potential that occurs when you get feedback, an individual gets feedback that they've made the wrong choice on a task. They used a stop signal task for this uh, uh, and gave with feedback about whether they made the right choice or not. In normals, you get an error-related negativity uh, uh, potential. I'll go over this again. In patients with OCD or generalized anxiety or individuals with the trait of intolerance of uncertainty, it's, it's higher. Um, but what they showed here is that with sham stimulation, they got um, an expected waveform. With anodal stimulation, they enhanced it. With cathodal, they suppressed it. Um, and this is their electric field modeling of showing uh, pre-SMA and dorsal cingulate um, uh, areas where they modeled the current uh, being uh, deposited. And, it, but, and now here, so here are the, the uh, behavioral, the electrophysiological results again. Their performance also changed um, in line with these results. And here is the generator of these evoked potentials using source localization. So it's not the electric field from TDCS. And again, it was in areas that we wanted to modulate. So we picked this montage, the cathode up here, the anode in the right cheek, um, and, um, uh, and really uh, rectangular electrodes. Um, it was hard to find a way to hold them on. So my genius research assistant here, Lynn Hanna, found this Chinese uh, facial slimming mask on Amazon, seven bucks, um, and it worked perfectly. Um, I showed this to Maram Bixen, and he said, you know, we could sell you something for a hundred bucks, but it won't be as good as this. <laughs> so um, that's what we wound up doing, and we're in the middle of doing this now. So far, I'll tell you that this is an open label design, but four out of the seven people really the six valuable people we enrolled showed a symptom improvement uh, after 10 sessions twice a day. Could you say exactly what the anode, the stimulus looked like? Can you say cathode, nano, what's the pulse width? Hey, no, no, it's just DC. It's just polarization. It's 20 minutes. You just turn it on. You, you ramp it up over 30 seconds. 
and it's constant, and then it ramps down at the end of that 20 minutes. The sham version, if you're going to do a sham, is ramping up over 30 seconds and then down again. Um, we're not doing a sham in our experiment. So um, the, uh, now, now TMS in OCD, which is really where I began with brain stimulation, has been a useful probe of excitability in networks. Um, and I'll just point out to some really old work uh, that I did at, with Ulf Zeman and other colleagues at the NIH and Mark Hallett's lab, um, showing that um, intracortical inhibition, short interval intracortical inhibition in the motor cortex in patients with OCD uh, is reduced. I won't spend a lot of time on it. And also the motor, the active and resting motor thresholds were also um, uh, lower in patients with OCD. Um, the, uh, and this did not seem to be a function of the medicines that many of them were on. Um, picking up on this, Antonio Montovani, who was initially in Siena, then at uh, Columbia, and now at CUNY, working with Maram Bixen, um, did an open label trial of one hertz uh, TMS to the SMA, pre SMA, it's not that focal in OCD. And they gave 1,200 pulses a day at one hertz at the resting motor threshold intensity, individualized. And they found a reduction in uh, OC severity. Again, severe people, severely ill people. Uh, and the longer they did it, the better the reduction got. Um, 10 sessions would be considered short for depression. Um, but it's where the depression world started. He then did a study that was controlled and looked at motor cortex excitability metrics. And um, he uh, showed that most people who completed this uh, four weeks of stimulation, so that was 20 sessions now, getting closer to what you do for depression, had a 25% Y-box reduction. That's a partial response or better. Um, and there, was, there tended to be a normalization of uh, the um, intracortical inhibition metric. Um, so, um, we're going to be doing that, uh, sorry, I'm going to skip the sort of deeper, even less focal uh, TMS we're going to use, and then ultimately we're going to do individualized TMS, where we're going to try to use individual functional connectivity maps uh, with Randy Buckner at Harvard and Hsiang Liu um, to see whether we can find um, uh, a cortical window that might vary a little bit across individuals to see if we can't get better results. Um, and that's kind of the culmination of this NIH-funded center. Um, the last slide I want to show you is um, a, a robot. This is a robot that uh, is made by Axillum Robotics, a French company. It costs 250K. It is something designed to hold the TMS coil um, uh, because actually um, uh, positioning of the coil and holding it in place is a big problem for this uh, treatment, but so is $250,000 <laughs> for a cost. So um, I think that uh, we um, will see more of these kinds of devices uh, that might be helpful to us, and they can use neuro navigation. You can put an MRI in and see where you're uh, targeting on the structural MRI. So to end, I want to quote Winston Churchill, which is, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Uh, and I think that's where we are. Of course, he also said this, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Yes. For treatment, can mm -hmm. you comment on what we think we've learned about the pathophysiology of the circuit in response to treatments? Is it overactive, underactive, dismodulated? What's going on? Right. So we, I haven't shown you any of the brain imaging data. Um, we know uh, from other studies, including some of our own from the beginning, that we are affecting the circuitry when we do deep brain stimulation, for example. 
PET trials uh, have shown that. And uh, even an fMRI study, which was technically very difficult to do. But in truth, the idea has been that the, the, the circuitry is hyperconnected and overactive within the core of OCD the OCD circuitry, and there is a disconnection of the cognitive control circuitry so that the, the um, uh, influence of the parts of the network that you would need to engage in goal-directed instead of kind of habitual and automatic behaviors is too low in OCD. Uh, and so, um, so the original idea was you've got a hyperactive circuit, you put a hole in it, you tone it down with meds, um, you, uh, um, you might improve symptoms that way. And that, uh, to an extent, seems to be true. But the second level that we're working on now is that what you really need to do is change the integration of these two different kinds of networks, where you need to improve the influence of the cognitive control network over this core uh, o hypothesized OCD circuit. Okay. Um, when you talk about uh, like uh, sham studies and, and uh, uh, for this research, w when you say turn it on or don't turn it on, do they have a, a, a perception that they f they feel more satisfied, they have less doubt, or does it take some time to wear? I mean, can you really do a sham study if they're if they're perceiving that they feel better, right? It's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to do sham. Let let me explain our procedure. You know, we made a well cardboard box where we put the programmer in, so they can't they can't see it. We tend we start. Uh, I mean, in the first place, we have a problem because we need to in the operating room activate the device. We can't not do that because in case we think we need to change the positioning. Um, so we do that and we make tests. And so if the patients have a response, a mood elevation is the typical one. Sometimes there are there is a, a, a unilateral smile, contralateral to the site of stimulation, which could be due to cingulate face fibers or you know other approach, uh, other uh, systems getting recruited. Then they're going, and if they remember that, they're going to remember what it felt like. However, when we actually do it on an outpatient basis after about a month rest, we start with low intensities and then gradually try to ramp it up. Um, and when we, you know, you need to create your map of what the effects are. Um, usually, there is no Sensi sensory change, not always. At high intensities, you can get what's called pocket stim. So, you know, if you're doing high intensity monopolar stimulation, they can feel the stimulation in the pocket where the pulse generator is. Um, then they know it's on. Uh, the, uh, usually you don't have that. Sometimes you have other things. In fact, uh, effects on the face, uh, parasthetic uh, like e experiences, which is a good prognostic sign, by the way. Um, but it's ve it is very hard to blind it. However, most of the people um, uh, will not immediately know that it's on, and we're not looking for immediate effects, um, at least not in OCD, and we don't expect those to be immediate. Um, however, you know, some patients will know. The other thing I showed you is that patients who improve, either due to a microlesion effect or the intensity of this whole process, and I'm glad you raised that, because let me say, these patients have been trying to get into this study for sometimes a year or more, the evaluation is exhaustive and intensive, and they've got to stick with it. Then they come for an in-person evaluation, which is about a week long, and then their stuff is gone, goes to an independent review committee, which you know gives final approval, and they're waiting for that. Then they go through the surgery, which is a very intense uh, uh, week or so, and then they're hospitalized overnight. And then they go through the very frequent and intense follow-up, and they have a 24-hour, uh, seven days a week line to you. Uh, you know, where you, you have to respond right away to these patients if they're having side effects or anything. There's no treatment we know of, including the lesion procedures, that are anywhere near as intense as this. So those nonspecific effects of this treatment setting, I think, are as important as any hints they might get that a device is on or not. 
This is a, a huge deal for them. Um, so, yep. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, should you describe uh, a focused approach to the OCD problem in three different ways? One is right. highly specific and localized in the right. brain. One is non-invasive, but sub-threshold with DCT. Right. One that's non-invasive, but <coughs> still super threshold because e EM fields actually have to be. So right. can you give us a relative idea of how effective each one of these are? Is, and what does that tell you about the mechanisms? Right. We can't because we don't know yet. Um, you know, the, the development of, uh, uh, well, in, in one sense, the patients aren't comparable. So, you know, the patients who come to surgery are the most intractably ill. Now, um, it, it, from a practical matter, the, the, the patient populations might be a little more similar than we would expect because it's really only the people who are not working uh, or working part-time or, or very impaired for the non-invasive studies who will actually come, spend the time to have repeated sessions of anything. Um, but the surgery group is a different group. Uh, I mean, they've had uh, often residential treatment, um, so we're not comparing apples to apples in, uh, clinically. Um, in terms of the TDCS uh, and uh, TMS differences, the sub-threshold versus super-threshold, I think the best um, approach to that, the best data, are certainly going to be from depression, not for OCD. Um, where OCD, there's not much in the way of data yet. It's accumulating, but they're mostly small, very small, N of one or two case series, and then some uh, controlled trials. But there's a lot for, a lot of controlled trials and a lot of con uh, uh, real world experience for TMS for depression, and starting to be for transcranial DC stimulation. Um, my impression is that uh, up to now, TMS is likely to be more effective than uh, electrical stim, but we're still at an early stage, and I will, I will argue against that by saying that we know that transcranial DC stimulation applied as an anode to the dorsolateral PFC um, can produce hypomania in depressed patients. So hypomania is, you, is something you see in individuals who um, uh, are having effective antidepressant treatment. Um, you can produce that with drugs. You can produce that, um, uh, you know, with um, well, yeah, you know, with drugs, uh, or even with light therapy uh, in people with seasonal affective disorder. And so that suggests that there's an, a bona fide treatment effect of transcranial DC stim. Um, but we, but again, we we can't compare the very large body of, of data in depression for TMS and TDCS. Um, so, you know, the answer is, I don't know. Thanks, Ben. I, I have two questions. Uh, well, one, I wasn't clear. You said the, uh, the patients who started out with the sham group uh, then had the stimulus turned on. Right. But. Was it a true crossover study that people who were active in the first phase have their systems turned off? All right, let me answer that one first. The answer is no, because when we tried that in our open label phase and do a blinded withdrawal, people crashed and burned. Um, it was worse than baseline for some of them, and which is why I am worried about discontinuation designs. now. In the, those early days, we just turned it off. And if we had ramped it down very gradually, maybe we would have gotten uh, away with it. But people had dramatic worsening of depression and anxiety and sometimes suicidality. Uh, so we gave that up. And the, um, uh, the thing that um, I would, so this was a delayed start for half of them. Uh, but. Uh, so you have to be aware of that if you're, if you're looking at discontinuation designs. Even if it didn't help all that much, they might feel it a lot more when you stop. And these are patients who are vulnerable to suicide. I, I didn't say it, but I will now, that one of the patients in this trial at four years who didn't get better had died by suicide. And you know, this, this it will happen in this population. Second. So there, 
Um, I guess I was wondering, is the notion that if this works for recalcitrant, the hardest to treat patients, that it'll work with less severe patients? And what, what is the, uh, it always impresses me, this is always the treatment of last resort. Right. And uh, what's the time course of behavioral and drug therapy for those people who do respond and is response to DBS faster than that? Well, actually, it's fascinating because um, then I didn't show it. But if you look at our open label DBS uh, data and uh, what they show is exactly what you'd see with a drug trial. Um, you j and these are people who are still on drugs. They've had behavior therapy. You see that the first response is to nonspecific anxiety, then depression, and then OCD. And the OCD result plateaus at three months. That is exactly what happens. That's after ventral capsule, ventral striatum, DBS. That's exactly what happens in uh, regular garden variety OCD patients who uh, respond to drug. It's exactly the same. That's why we picked three months. We thought, OK, the OCD response plateaus, and we didn't want to expose people to sham who've been waiting so long, longer than we had to. And we may have made a mistake there, but we didn't know that. The, um, uh, so the, and the response to behavior therapy is highly variable. But normally, you would do, you know, we insist on at least um, 13 sessions in, a, in clinical practice. For this, we in, in, insisted on 20. Um, and so 13 sessions, if it's every week, is about three months. And you know, you're going to be able to get a sense of whether it works or not. So um, it's suggesting right, uh, uh, that whatever the plasticity is that you're after, um, uh, even if you can't get to it with the conventional treatments in this population, it might take three months. <laughs> The responder rate in the DBS trial was somewhere in the 50% range. Is that about 56%, yeah. So do you have hypotheses? Like, what What don't you, do you know what you don't know? Or like, I mean, what, how do you explain the non-responders? Yeah. So, um, well, one I, I glancingly referred to is that these the pathways of interest vary in their exact anatomical position in individuals. And we may have just missed them in some patients. Uh, the other thing is that defining people in terms of this categorical construct of OCD will result in a heterogeneous sample. So we haven't analyzed it yet, but one possibility is that the incompleteness patients who are harder to treat with everything will be harder to treat with this. So it could be, we could be looking at clinical variables. We could also be looking, and I think we will find, that personality variables make a difference. And we don't normally diagnose people that way, but we collected the data to try to characterize people on things like neuroticism, which is a proxy for distressibility, um, extroversion, which is, uh, among other things, uh, seeking reward-related activities, um, uh, agreeableness, and agreeableness is important here because some of the people didn't follow up with their treatment uh, uh, appropriately, adequately. And conscientiousness, which is kind of a need for social approval. Um, the, uh, and the other thing is that the life circumstances are different in, in, in across these people. So if you think about OCD, um, which tends to be early onset in life. It's very different from Parkinson's. In Parkinson's, you have people who've had relatively normal life trajectories, and they get later in life after they've accumulated social, family, um, financial capital. But many of our patients never got there. The ones who did and who ever functioned well in life um, did better. Uh, so there are going to be, it's going to be a multifactorial thing. Um, and it may be also that the mechanistic underpinnings of symptoms that look similar are going to be different in some individuals. And that's going to take a lot of work to try to figure out. Um, it may be that the symptom subtypes will also be relevant. In prior surgeries, the checkers did best. Um, and so we'll see if that holds true in our sample, too. Does it matter how well the patients understand what you're doing? Most patients don't come to you with a strong grasp of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. Well, they, but, they, but they have often really looked into this. 
Um, and we had, in addition to an independent review committee, we, have, we had a consent monitor. The consent form was 14 pages long, which was often corrected by our patients <laughs> at OCD. Um, the, we used a follow-up feedback tool to describe and to make sure that they got it. Uh, uh, the, um, and so um, uh, what I will say, in a sense, is uh, that we, were, we would worry when people had unrealistic expectations of the therapy, that it would be like a brain transplant, or even worse, a life transplant. The patients who tended to do the best were those who had expectations that this would give them maybe a 10 or 20 percent help, right, where they were, uh, which would make a big difference in the number of symptom-free hours in their day. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we explained things in pretty great detail, but we didn't expect them to understand physiology. And in truth, we still don't know what it causes OCD. We, we were able to tell them that we know from a history of surgical procedures that this circuitry seems to be involved, and when you intervene in it, people can get better. You know, that's what we knew. Do you have any plans to look at genetics? Well, you know, I, I, in my other life, and I, I've still, I've done a ton of genetics, the problem is there that what you see um, in genetics is you need samples of 40,000 people to find, and I'm not kidding, uh, to find effects, because there are often rare variants that will, it's like Tolstoy, all happy families are alike, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, so th there are these rare variants that affect things. So we, you know, we, we may be able to look at something, but I don't have, hold out many hopes with the sample sizes we have. Um, is there agreement between the clinicians and patients on what a minimally uh, clinically you know, important difference would be for their symptom changes? And have you explored at all yet a uh, patient's perception or their willingness to trade off the specific risks with the specific benefits that they might be getting with these technologies? Well, so um, we have... Um, have have gone into the risks and benefits in great detail. Not only that, we present to them alternatives, the alternative of lesion procedures. Um, we tell them everything we know about all of those things. Um, and about half of them will choose lesion procedures. They will choose not to have implanted devices that require maintenance forever and that require them to be near experts um, or at least come and follow up. Um, the, uh, and some people don't want holes in their skull, and they're willing to have holes in their brain instead. Um, that uh, discussion gets distorted because due to 1970s federal law, uh, Medicare, and many of these patients have Medicare by virtue of disability, um, will not um, pay for lesion procedures. It's excluded by statute. Uh, they, it will pay for DBS. And, uh, and then private insurers of various kinds, usually you have to go through lots of appeals and sometimes you can get them to pay for it. And of course, if, you, if they don't pay for it up front, they're not going to be supportive of the aftercare that they require, and they require a lot of aftercare. Um, so I think the, uh, in that 14-page consent form, they have a very good idea of the things that could go wrong uh, and what, the, what we might expect, and we don't promise benefit, but of course they all hope for a miracle. And what happens there, despite everything we say, is that sometimes people will stop all their meds. And that doesn't go well, because this is an adjunctive treatment in almost all cases. So we do everything we can, um, and you know, often it goes well, but sometimes these patients will say anything to get in, so that's why the evaluation process is a year long. Dr. Greenberg, you offer me an opportunity here that uh, you're going to indulge, I ask you to indulge me for a minute. All right. A couple weeks ago, several, there are a number of us were talking about electron transfer processes hmm. that occur on uh, neural stimulating electrodes, and they're in this room. And uh, as I think about this transcutaneous DC stimulation hmm. for 20 minutes, 
I'm thinking, and I hope they're thinking, uh, what are the processes going on here? So you have oxygen reduction going, you have oxygen evolution at the anode, hydrogen evolution at the cathode, you have cations and ions moving in there. How, is, how in the world is this happening in here? And are you using, what metals are you using? Because the reaction processes are going to be a function of those metals. Right. Uh, there was one other element in here. This is old age creeping in. <laughs> it's all right. That, uh, but, well, it's the accumulation of these, of these products in here. I just don't see how this can work. I just don't well, see it. Well, because it, it helped me explain why the accumulation of the redox products is going to be a problem. It's on the surface. Yes. Well, it's true, but, but you can measure, um, you know, if you look at phantoms or, or, uh, or even models, you can measure some current density deeper. Of course, once you put an electrode in, you've... you've but now let's talk about what current density is. Mm -hmm. I guess the other part that I'd forgotten, are you using regulated current or are you using a voltage source? There's so, a voltage, you know, it's a, it's a battery device, so it is, um, it, okay. and it's so electrically the isolated. It's going to be dropping off with time until it reaches is some steady state in there. Yeah. But that constitutes ions moving, cations moving in one direction, anions moving in the other. Hmm. I don't see it. Well, okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to put you no, on no, the spot. No, 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 no. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, un I'm just trying to understand the, um, the uh, you know the concept not being an engineer of um, you know these are basically wet sponges that we put on people's heads or other parts of them uh, and uh, there are effects that certainly happen locally people feel tingling they get uh, redness you know their vascular effects and other effects um, and uh, you see effects in the brain as in the Reinhardt paper that I described, when I think that was a very well-controlled study. So um, you remember you're talking to somebody who does psychiatry. In psychiatry, we have no idea what's wrong with our patients, really, but our treatments are OK. Um, and uh, so we are more comfortable, uh, it's kind of unfortunate, with, the, with um, not understanding how everything works, but if, but, but uh, let's, um, uh, you know, so I don't know if another engineer or uh, individual in the room wants to respond to this particular uh, issue, but, um, you know, I think there's electricity deposited in the brain, at least according to modeling and all that. Electricity deposited in the brain doesn't exist. Okay. Free charge doesn't exist in here. Okay. Something's always moving. There's not an exception. Well, there has to be charge so, carriers. I, mean, the, I get that. The interest in here, I don't mean to be putting you on the spot, but I hope I'm getting some of these folks thinking. Some of them are not looking up right now. I'm looking at them. They're looking down at the floor. But uh, I think it's... You know, trying to understand how this works. So these are the kinds of questions right. that a lot of people in this field look at electricity in the body as magic. Yeah, well. And what I'm trying to get through is not magic. Okay. And trying that if you understand how this works, you can really see the beauty of it mm. rather than focusing on the magic or guessing how it might work. Well, so it's asking these fundamental questions about how these processes go. Does this make sense? Or well, how can we make sense out of this? So I'm not trying to... No, no, it's fine. My make base, trouble. I guess the best answer... Base, let me stop you one second. Okay. What you're seeing is my obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> well, here's my, here's my answer. What would your old student, Maram Bixson, say in answer to that question? <laughs> well, you know, we should ask him. Uh, no. You referenced him. I thought he might even be in the room. No, 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 no. He's, I think, it's still in Spain. Um, so, no, and, you know, we, can't, we probably can't uh, get him on the line. So, all right. Thank you for the question. What you would say is, is that there is current passing between these two electrodes. Right. There, there's no question about it. So, this measurable, you can see a current density J passing between the anode and the cathode. What goes on at the reaction at the electrode is happening and stays in the uh, in the, in the uh, foam, whatever 
substances put between the electrode and the brain. There are reactions there, the, the position of different compounds, changes in pH probably, it's all happening on the sponge. It's not touching the skin. Yet the current is passing through and you can actually model it and you find that if you measure J and E and sigma, it sort of fits with what you expect to find. Now the problem is not that. Hmm. The problem is that these fields are so low. They're very weak. They are below what is the minimum recorded effect of about one millivolt per millimeter. That, those electric fields are below that, and the lowest recorded effect is one millivolt per millimeter. So how is this working? That is a real problem. Not so much if there's current passing there at all. I know. Okay. Well, I'm glad I could bring you two together. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. So then, oh. I have a reminder of your trip here to oh. Cleveland. and uh, Thank you. Um, Wow. Thank you again, everyone, and thanks, wow. Ben. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Bob.